Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we invite you to join us for a conversation with New York Times bestselling author Marcus Brotherton for the paperback release of his book, Blaze of Light, a biography about Green Beret Army medic Gary Bykirk, who received the Medal of Honor for his actions of valor during the siege of Doxang. Marcus Brotherton is a bestselling author and collaborative writer known for his books with high-profile public figures, humanitarians, inspirational leaders, and military personnel. His works were featured in HBO's Band of Brothers miniseries and HBO's The Pacific. In Blaze of Light, Marcus tells the story of Gary Bykirk from April 1, 1970, when some 10,000 enemy soldiers sought to obliterate the 12 American Special Forces troops and 400 indigenous fighters who stood fast to defend 2,300 women and children inside the village of Doxang. For his valor and selflessness during the ruthless siege, Gary Bykirk would be awarded the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest and most prestigious military decoration. But Gary returned home wounded in body, mind, and soul. To find himself again, Gary retreated to a cave in the mountains of New England, where a redemptive encounter with God allowed Gary to find peace. Actor and humanitarian Gary Sinise said, What Gary Bykirk did to receive his medal is unforgettable, and the story of what he overcame afterward is as big and moving as they come. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you on Memorial Day from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Marcus Brotherton and Reagan Foundation and Executive Director, John Highbush. Well, uh, we're welcoming uh, Marcus Brotherton with us today at the Reagan Library, Reagan Foundation. And I, Marcus, a wonderful, wonderful book, one of many that you've done, many bestsellers, and uh, I, I just really appreciate you being with us today to talk about what turned out, as I read it, to me to be a really important and a terrific book. So thanks for your time today, Marcus. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Um, first, I'd like to just fast forward from the book and talk about Gary Bykirk, who's the subject of your book first. I understand uh, Marcus, that uh, Gary, uh, what an incredible fellow, um, and he's right now not able to join us for this because he's going through yet another difficult time in his life, right? How is, how is Gary doing as far as you know? Uh, Gary, a tremendous man, and uh, became a, a genuine friend uh, through the writing of this book, uh, we worked for about a year, year and a half together, fairly closely on the book. Had him over to the house series, met my family. Uh, just a tremendous man. So right now, and, and he's mentioned this on social media, so it's it's not confidential, but he's, he's battling cancer. It's pancreatic cancer, stage four. Um, I phoned him actually just before I got on this interview and uh, asked him how he's doing today. He really wanted to be here with us. As you know, he's feeling quite weak uh, through the, the treatments. Uh, he did give me a message uh, to tell the viewers here. And if you'd like, I can read that an hour yeah, please. later on. The... Good. So this is directly from Gary. I actually wrote it down here just so I got it, um, got it word for word. He says, um, <clears throat> I wish for you every success in life, uh, yet there's something greater than success, and that's significance. Significance is what I wish for you more than anything. Significance is straightforward. Everybody can attain significance. It comes when we love others. And that's what matters most in life. Investing in people, listening to people, loving other people. Gary says, I'm often identified as a Green Beret or a Medal of Honor recipient 
or as chaplain of the Medal of Honor Society. Yet my main identity, and I want you to know this, is a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus addressed people in John 13, 34, and he said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love another. Directly from Gary today. Yeah, that's neat. And uh, boy, does that ring true uh, to hear that from Gary after you've read uh, A Blaze of Light. Uh, it's what is it that these subjects of your books have in common? I wonder if, if they do have something in common. Um, it's such an incredible line of books. And when you get to Blaze of Light, you think, boy, do I want to read what Marcus has written in the past because this guy is just an incredible example of an incredible American. It's, it's always the individual that, that intrigues me, John, and it's, it's people who are doing heroic things or noble things. Uh, they're often placed in very difficult uh, experiences, often, often horrific uh, experiences and times and situations. And yet uh, it's what they do in the midst of those experiences that I believe are examples for us. And, and they're, uh, we can, many of us are not facing war ourselves, but we're in difficult situations. And it's how do you respond? How do you respond to that grace under, under fire, to that courage under fire? How did Gary's story in particular come to you, Marcus? It was very kind of a friend of a friend, uh, uh, a person who I just barely know on Facebook um, sent me a message and asked if he could uh, talk about a book that he's interested in writing. And I, I almost always say no to that just because my schedule is so full. But for some reason, I took the call. And uh, sure enough, his book uh, wasn't going to work out. And when I sort of started talking to him about what's all involved in writing a book. He, uh, he uh, wasn't as interested. Uh, but then we just uh, just relaxed and started talking about people we knew in common. And, and then he told me this story about this Medal of Honor recipient. And I, I was just blown away on the phone. And immediately when I, when I hung up on the phone, I, I looked up Gary. And fortunately, he, he keeps a fairly uh, robust presence on social media. And so I sent him a uh, just a, a, a cold email just saying, hi, I'm Marcus Brotherton. I write books for a living. Uh, have you ever thought about telling your story? And he responded right away saying, my wife and I have been talking about this for years, uh, never quite knowing if it's the right time or place or situation. And right now we believe it is the right time. Let's do a book. <laughs> yeah, that is neat. And, um, you know, uh, Marcus, when I was a kid uh, and I, one of my first jobs out of college, I had the chance to write um, for, and I was at the Pentagon, and, and I ran into the story where they asked me to uh, write a piece about a, a fellow that was winning um, a medal from the Secretary of Defense, and I read it and I said, this can't be real, what this guy has done. It turned out to be a true story, and then it went on from there to where this fellow won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And to tell us a, about what is it that qualifies or certifies someone to win this highest of awards? It's the highest, most prestigious uh, honor given to any member of the Ar uh, Armed Service. Um, I think there's about 70 or 71 living recipients right now of, of the Medal of Honor. Uh, it's given for acts of valor during combat. It's often given posthumously just because it's so uh, such a difficult honor to ever achieve. People don't ever set out to achieve it. Uh, it's, it's, and Gary gave me a real education. You, you don't win the, the award. You're a recipient of the award. And uh, when, when people do receive it, it, it actually can become almost a burden because there's a real uh, a sense of, of, of gravitas that comes with this. And, and we really need to... Uh, the, the men say, and, and few women have re, uh, received it, say we, we need to wear it for everybody else who has served. Um, it was created uh, just after the Civil War. There's about 3,500 recipients total who have ever received it. And you got to think, you know, just in World War II alone, there were 16 million troops in America uh, who served in the armed services. And so that's how rare uh, this medal is. It is the most elite of the most elite. And like you say, Marcus, it's, 
it's not something you can compete for. Often you think that metals are. Um, um, it's, it's, oh, if there's one thing I've heard from the other Medal of Honor recipients beyond Gary, it is um, this is not something you shoot for. You know, you, <laughs> this is something truly awarded. Um, uh, but the other thing I think I've sensed that I hear in common from Medal of Honor recipients, it's like, you know, I don't really, I didn't deserve this. This is not something that was given to me appropriately. It's, well, I'll let you tell us. What do they often say? Because I know this is what you've heard from, from, from Gary Bykirk. Yeah, Gary received his medal, um, threw it in a duffel bag, didn't touch it for the next seven years. <laughs> And, and it, it took just a, an inner working, and, and he really had to, to work through why me, uh, why was I allowed to live when so many died to begin with, and then why was I singled out uh, for this award, and then um, should I wear it today, and if I do wear it, what does that mean? And really, it was his fellow veterans who surrounded him, particularly the Vietnam veterans, because such a difficult era for a nation's history, and they said, no, 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 you have to wear this, Gary, you have to wear it for everybody who served, wear it for everybody who acted nobly. Yeah, and that's, right, and that's what they seem to end up doing, right? They, they go through this transition where they, they come to an understanding that the award might be, have been bestowed on them, but at the end of the day, it's really something that was bestowed on those, their fellow man, those they served with, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think you've said there's been thousands uh, of these awards given over time to the fellows like uh, Gary, but it's unique in that there's been many, many, I think hundreds that are given, as you said, posthumously, right? Uh, why is that? Why, why, are, why is it the nation ends up looking backwards in time and, and decides that someone who's long past uh, has, deserves it? Well, and sometimes it's fairly immediate, too. The action has taken place fairly recently, but the, the, the service personnel person just, just didn't survive the, the, the event, the, the battle. And it's uh, a guy who jumps on a grenade to save his buddy's life or to save, uh, you know, a, a platoon of men or, or whatever it is. And uh, these are things that, that people describe. You know, we, we can't necessarily plan for these things, but it's the training, the the what you've ingested for so many years and and the the smaller decisions that you've made at so many places of, uh, along the way in your life and then it comes out at that one critical moment that one crucial moment and and a noble and, and selfless deed is done now let's get into uh gary's story in particular and i i think in order to do so it really involves a setup here and just as your book uh, presses forward it gets into the 1960s 1970s um, it you really I if I have to say something that was just wonderful about this book Marcus is, is that you captured perfectly I think that moment um, in our nation uh, when well, frankly it was the Vietnam generation can can you describe for us the time that Gary was uh, living in uh, as he decided to enlist and, you know, head to Vietnam. It was, it was a definitely a difficult time in our nation's history. Uh, and I was born in 1968, and so I just sort of lived through the tail end, but really as a child. So it's been in, in studying in retrospect that, uh, you know, talking to my parents even, and, uh, and what they were watching on the news each night and, and, and their conversations that they were having with their friends. So definitely a, a time of a divided nation. And uh, the big question was, uh, is this a war worth fighting? Should we really be involved in this as a country? We had sworn as a nation to protect other countries from the threat at that point of, of communism. And so as, as North Vietnam was, was coming down into South Vietnam and then also the, uh, some of the soldiers were coming up from the bottom as well, um, there was there was talk about a, a larger threat, and if Vietnam falls, uh, what other countries will fall? Will it be a domino experience where 
Laos and, and all these other countries sort of surrounding Vietnam will happen. So uh, Vietnam was in the spotlight, definitely, but but the nation was looking around it. And there's also the draft. Uh, you know, today we're, we're very, um, choose your words carefully here, privileged to live in a time where there is no draft. It's, the, the, it's an all-voluntary military. But back then, uh, boy, if your draft card came up, if, if your number came up, uh, you know, you had to go. And so um, it was difficult. And there were protests and, and uh, burning of draft cards. And uh, it forces us to ask, what, we, what, we, what would we have done uh, back there had we been uh, eligible uh, for the draft? And would we have uh, served or would we have uh, opposed the war? Uh, definitely not a, a black and white time. Yeah, and so many at the time, as you describe in your book, uh, experimenting with drugs and, you know, uh, the, in Gary's case in particular, it seemed like uh, he was in search of meaning during this time frame. And um, in, in, on his search, it seemed like he drank a whole lot and I um, in, ended up blacking out and all sorts of things that would occur in, in that generation. Um, in your talks with Gary, did he ever uh, come out and say to you, Mark, yeah, I was an alcoholic. I just, maybe I didn't admit it at the time, but I was. Uh, he certainly struggled uh, for a time and, and, and uh, a number of seasons. Um, you know, he was, he was a Green Beret special ops. It's like, well, why did he join the service? Initially, there was no sense of heroics on his behalf. Uh, he was dating a girl and the girl broke up with them. And uh, Gary was on campus at the university one day and he sees this guy go by who's wearing a uniform. And he looks really snappy. And Gary thought, you know, that could be me. And if I was wearing this uniform, maybe that, uh, maybe, you know, I, I would really show my girlfriend what she was missing, right? So he enlists, uh, and then he begins to learn what it's all about. And then he describes more of a sense of heroics came with it. Uh, he became a medic within the Green Beret. That was his specialty. And uh, it wasn't about sort of, uh, I want to go over there and kill. It was about, I want to go over there and help. I want to go serve. I want to help people, uh, uh, you know, get better and, and live better lives. And um, with, with the military subculture, there were some rough edges. Um, and, and, uh, Gary says, uh, he didn't even want to get sent to, to Vietnam. That was not sort of first and foremost in his, uh, in his reasons for going, but he had gotten drunk and, and gotten in a car and, and had a kind of a series of, of bad events that led to his arrest. And, uh, so he appeared before the judge one day and the judge said, okay, you know, you've, you've got a choice here. We can send you to jail or to Vietnam. And Gary said, hello, Vietnam. <laughs> so that's how he got <laughs> fairly a uh, circuitous route. Yeah. Um, and the story you just told about his passage to Vietnam and then certainly while in Vietnam, it's so full of detail, uh, Marcus, that I it made me wonder, how is it that you're able to get subjects uh, like Gary to remember so much, and I mean, because it's almost like you're taken back to the moment, and you're right there with Gary. But yet, it was many, many years ago. What's your process of working with subjects of your book to draw that detail from them? You know, to to make the books like this as colorful as they are. Yeah, great question. We work a lot on just relaxing. Yeah, within the interview process. And um, some veterans, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, the, the Band of Brothers and, and the Band of uh, Fought in the Pacific and, and, and uh, veterans from Modern Wars as well. And there's one commonality that comes uh, from these experiences is that veterans often don't want to talk. And, you know, we, we did our job and now we're home and let's not talk about this. So there's, there's a lot of conversations just about, well, why, why might we write this book? Uh, is there some good? that can come from your story. Well, let's focus on the good. Let's, let's focus on the purpose of this. And um, boy, guys I've worked with have, have told me that it feels therapeutic uh, to, to, to go through the process of writing a book. Uh, one of my dear, dear friends is, is uh, Sergeant Rob Kugler, who uh, uh, was, was veteran of, of modern wars. He's a Marine. And um, I don't think Rob would mind me telling you this, but when he got in my office, and we started talking, 
probably within 10 minutes of the conversation, he was in tears, big, mm -hmm. tough Marine. You know, he had lost his brother over there. And this was one of the first times that this story was coming out. And it was cathartic and we, we wept together. I mean, it was, uh, here was this guy just raw and, uh, and ha having been through so much, uh, but, but wanting his story to do some good in the world. And so we, we were to tell it together. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you'd say that about the stories of modern day soldiers and veterans. It's uh, uh, almost as though in telling you their story, it's therapeutic. They, uh, it might even be the very first time they've talked with someone, I, I presume, about their story. Did you, do you see any uh, difference, Marcus, in those from, you know, the greatest generation and the silent generation, World War II through the modern day, is there generally a reluctance uh, to talk about their combat experiences? Um, and how do you get them over that hump of relaying things that can oftentimes be as difficult as they are? Yeah, there seems to be a, a greater um, emphasis placed on telling your story these days than there was in yesteryear, that's for sure. Uh, I think there's more of a supportive community now. Um, I think in America, we, we tend to give a lot of honor to our, our service personnel in, in all the best ways. Um, the, the men I've talked to from World War II, it was a different story. They came home from the war and the atmosphere was um, happy days. I mean, we, we won the war and now let's go out and buy ourselves a new refrigerator and a new home and, you know, get married and a car and we got to get off life. And so uh, probably more, more of an emphasis then on, on stoic masculinity. Let's be quiet. Let's keep things to ourselves. Uh, I talked with a veteran, Frank Sobolewski, who's one of the Band of Brothers, and uh, boy, he, he struggled for years and years and years and, and had any number of, of combat fatigue uh, style experiences, nightmares, headaches, uh, back when he's in the moment and, and it comes again and he's, he's in the, he can see it all as if it's really happening again. And so um, Frank had chosen not to talk to anybody about the war ever, period, and <clears throat> struggled and struggled for years. One day his wife sits him down and basically says, hey, Frank, how's that working for you, buddy? How's that working for you? <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of a simple question. Uh, there was a reunion coming up and Frank didn't want to go. And his wife said, well, maybe. Why don't you just try going to this reunion? And he did. He opened up. He, he saw his buddies again. And things started changing for him. And, and that process of talking, that process of getting it out, uh, really, really helped. Sure. Um, now, uh, Marcus, you make the point that uh, when Gary Bykirk uh, went to Vietnam, you know, this is not as though this was his life's dream. You know, he ended up there for interesting reasons. But um, once he got there, um, you in the book references uh, a quote that I think was up uh, on the wall in a, a dispensary and um, Gary notices this quote, and you, he took note of it, and you did as well. And it, it says, uh, to really live, you must almost die. To those who fight for it, life has a meaning the protected will never know. I wonder, as you pulled this story from Gary, um, is that the way he felt about life? while he's in Vietnam and then lived throughout his life. And, and what do you think about that particular, uh, about that quote? Hmm. It's funny, after the war, Gary, uh, he studied psychology and education, got his master's degree, eventually worked as a, as a middle school counselor for years and years and years. And one day he was, he was telling uh, his students, his middle school students in his classroom about that quote. And this little guy raises his hand and said, what do you mean, Mr. B? Because they all really affectionately referred to him as Mr. B. What do you mean to really live, I almost have to die? Isn't that a contradiction? And Gary says, well, yes, but in a sense, here's what it means. Uh, it means that you lay down your life. You serve others. You say other people are just as valuable as me. Sometimes other people are more valuable than me. But we are all in this together. And we will go forward uh, together when uh, I put aside my wishes for your wishes. 
uh, I put aside what I'm really uh, hoping for, for, uh, for what you're really hoping for. And together we can build this. And uh, the little guy got it. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting, um, Marcus, as you wrote about that being Gary's interpretation of those words, um, you know, if you just stare at them blankly and don't know that they're associated with Gary's experience, uh, when you hear people talk about, well, in order to really understand what it's like to live, you have to come, you know, you have to have a near-death experience. It's, you know, guys that are parachuting and doing all sorts of crazy things. It's almost like a thrill, you know. Um, it's that adrenaline one gets by almost dying, and now you really know how to live. But that's not what Gary took out of this. He, he took from this, quote, something very different, I think, and, and probably more meaningful, right? Yeah, you know, Gary, he talks about it on a on a marriage level, right? Um, you know, say you 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 and your in your spouse uh, suddenly you you have like a, a thousand extra dollars in your bank account uh, for whatever it is, and and what do you want to do with it? Well, uh, you know, the husband he wants to get a new chainsaw, and the the wife she wants to get a new refrigerator or whatever, you know. Uh, yeah. Who gets what? And he's saying, well, I really want this. And she's saying, I really want this. And Gary would say, well, the marriage works when, when the husband says, actually, I really want what you want. Uh, let's get that refrigerator. And the wife says, actually, I really want what you want. Let's get that mm -hmm. chainsaw. And then you start fighting over what the other person gets. Yeah. Uh, that process of, of going, you know, we got to work this out. we got to work this together. Sure. Um, now, you, you'll print uh up correct the pronunciation if I get this wrong, Marcus, but um, <clears throat> you delve into the story of this uh, tribe of people, uh, this community uh, of very unique people that are in uh, South Vietnam that Gary Bykirk um, is thrown, uh, thrown into and amongst. Um, it's the uh, the the Montagnard, um, uh, and I, I to please tell us something about this community because it's it's it uh, one has to understand who these people are in order to really understand how they influenced Gary Bykirk, I think. Yeah, and part of this really is what intrigued me um, and really drew me to Gary's story. But of all the of all the literature that's coming out of the Vietnam era, um, Gary's story was more black and white because of the people group he worked with, the, the, the Montagnard people. Uh, tribes people, uh, Central Highlands region, um, uh, the, the, the enemy had vowed not simply to assimilate the Montagnard culture into their autocratic system. It was, it was a death threat. Uh, the Montagnard people were viewed as lesser. And so the enemy had vowed to wipe this, this subculture off the, off the map. And so uh, these tribes people, it was their, their uh, a fight for their survival. We have to fight this war. Actually, we're really, really glad that America is in it because they're gonna give us some support. We're really glad to have the Green Berets here. Please help us fight to be able to live. And that's really what Gary had entered into. Yeah. Um, and as he enters into their story, um, now, this is not a quote that I think um, Gary referenced for you, but it's one that you inserted in the story that I really just thought was uh, very interesting. Um, and it's by G.K. Chesterton. Uh, he says, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him, right? And um, talk about... Um, how this, the meaning of this quote came true for Gary Biker, because I think it probably does for just about every soldier who enters combat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gary uh, entered this village and um, his job was to be chief medic. He was basically to be their doctor, even though he didn't have all the medical training that a full-fledged medical doctor would receive. He, he had enough, so he was tending to people's uh, wounds and, and treating sicknesses, he was delivering babies. He was he was being a dentist. I mean, you name it. Why people are glad that he's here because they really got some some medical um, help. And um, and Gary says how how he describes how the tribe just loved him for this. Mm -hmm. And Gary had grown up uh, without a father in his life and was always sort of searching for a place to belong. And 
he really found that place of belonging within the tribe. And he was there for about a year, and, he, and, and for the, the most of that year, he describes it as a jungle Shangri-La. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, uh, they were uh, playing volleyball with, with uh, people and, and taking the kids down to the river to go swimming. They, they put up a, a sheet, a bed sheet, and they were showing John Wayne movies on it at night. And it was just a, a real summer camp experience. And uh, the tribesmen made him an honorary tribes member, uh, full-fledged initiation into their culture. Uh, you are one of us. Thank you for being here. Yeah, really something. Um, but then uh, what you describe as the Shangri-La, uh, it, it all ended in a remarkable moment. Uh, and uh, maybe you could tell us about the heroic, the heroism displayed by Gary uh, in this story and uh, what the threat was that, that surrounded him at the time. Gary's in this little village called Dak Sang, and it's uh, it's close in proximity to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, it's the main supply line from uh, north to south for the communists. So it's a strategic village for a lot of reasons. Uh, April 1st, 1970, during the night, uh, the enemy crept uh, around this little village and completely surrounded it. So you got to think, in this village, there's 12 Green Berets. Gary's one of them. There's 400 indigenous fighters who are uh, Montagnard fighters. They're being trained to, to fight for their survival by the Green Berets. And then 2,300 women and children, uh, the wives of the fighters, the children, uh, some elderly folks, the, the, the parents and whatnot. So it, it really is, it's, it's not necessarily a, a military post. It's their home. And uh, 10,000 enemy soldiers, uh, the count was later, for the people inside, their odds are 24 to 1. I mean, they are really outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, you name it. Uh, dawn breaks, and this intense barrage begins. Just uh, shelling and, and firepower, and you name it, it's all coming inside the village. And again, you have to realize it's a situation of horror, because it's not simply uh, soldiers fighting soldiers here. It's, it's the enemies uh, shellacking this village of women and children. And so Gary's job is chief medic, and, and it's his job to save lives. And so he is running from person to person and, and seeing just some horrific things inside this village. Yeah, and then this is where the, the story, I think you'd agree, Marcus, it turns from the remarkable to the unbelievable as it relates to uh, why it is that Gary ends up becoming the recipient of the Medal of Honor, the, the heroic actions that he displays. Uh, I don't want to steal your thunder, but if you could describe for us his, how he's wounded and what he does even after he's wounded. Uh, it the, the people inside the camp are fighting back, the Green Braves, um, the Montagnard soldiers, uh, they're calling in air support. Uh, even then, they're, they're still receiving a, a real beating. And Gary is wounded uh, pretty early on in, in the firefight, wounded three times, hip, stomach, uh, leg. Uh, he's, he's hit uh, really close to the spine and paralyzed from the waist down. I mean, the guy can't walk. He is flat on the ground. Uh, it still has upper body feeling. He's still thinking. He's still conscious, but he, man, he can't walk. He his battle is finished. What good is a medic who can't walk? And this is really the the amazing uh, piece of this story is when Gary is paralyzed from the waist down, he calls two helpers to his side, and he says these two words. I just think need to live on forever in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. He says, "Carry me, drag me." help me continue to do my job. And so these two helpers, they, they pick him up, half pick him up, half drag him uh, from wounded person to wounded person to wounded person. And Gary is still able to administer aid to save lives, to help people in this extreme state of, of being hit and paralyzed from the waist down. Yeah, really something. And um, in your book, you, um, as Gary tells you this story, he relates to you something that um, that one often hears from someone who comes, you know, within a threat of of passing away. He he talks about uh, uh, that he had an out of body experience. Describe that. 
Yeah, and, and uh, we went to some psychology textbooks for this and just double checked it. And, and, and uh, people say, yeah, you, you can actually sort of see yourself rise out of your, your body and, and survey, survey the, the territory around you. And, and Gary describes this is what happened to him. He was surveying the battlefield from an out of body experience. Yeah, strange phenomenon. <clears throat> yeah, very much so. Uh, now, of course, in you know this incredible barrage that you talked about, Marcus, of this village, some truly, truly horrific things took place that Gary uh, was not only witness to but involved in. I, I, you know, I'm not asking you to get overly graphic, but this is the kind of thing that no human should really ever have to see, right? It definitely, uh, and, and due to the, the civilians uh, who are casualties in the midst, um, a story that Gary tells frequently is uh, of his bodyguard, who's this uh, Montagnard young man named Dale. And, and Dale is an experienced fighter, and I'm going to set this up a little bit. He's an experienced fighter. He knows the ways uh, of the jungle. He, he's been handling a weapon uh, fighting for his tribe for a long time, and Dale was 15. <laughs> and, and and here's this teenager. But that's the way it was in that tribal culture. You were you you became a man at age 12, and uh, becoming a man meant you were a protector, provider, protector, whatever it was. You pick up that rifle and you fight the enemies. And so Dale was a very experienced warrior even at age 15. And, and throughout the process of uh, working together, Gary and Dale became very close friends. So um, Dale was one of the helpers that Gary had called to the side, and, and Dale was helping drag Gary around. And in, in the process of helping these wounded people on the battlefield, uh, shells are still coming in. And uh, a shell comes in and, and Dale and the other helper throw Gary flat on the ground and Dale uh, jumps on top of Gary to shelter Gary with his body. And when the smoke is cleared from that particular explosion, Gary is still alive, but Dale is dead. Dale has, has taken the brunt. And Gary said that moment, uh, things changed for him enormously where he, he realized that this teenager had given his life so that he could live and, and keep helping people. Uh, it was something that, that changed the entire trajectory of Gary's life. Yeah, um, and I think in your book, Marcus, you, you talk about that Gary's view was this is the ultimate act of love, right? Yeah, and, and Dave had uh, spoken with Gary uh, many times up to that. Uh, Dale didn't have his own parents and just said, look, uh, Gary, you are my family. I'm sworn to protect you, and you're my friend. And where you go, I'm going to go. And if, and if you die, I die, and, and I'm going to give my life for yours. It was a yeah. remarkable relationship. Yeah, and, and it, you, can, you can tell from that point on, um, Gary, this is what drove some real difficulty for Gary um, as he healed himself um, as he tried to grapple with what had happened to him and what was the meaning of all of this, right? And um, I, I guess it would be fair to say that when Gary returned back home to the United States, he would probably be categorized as like the quintessential example of PTSD, right? Oh, absolutely. He, um, it, it took him a long, long time uh, to to heal. I mean, a process of years and years and years and sort of one step forward and three steps back. Um, he eventually was evacuated from the firefight by a helicopter and uh, and taken to a, to a, a hospital and um, it, actually a series of hospitals. And this is one of the stories he tells in the book where uh, he was wavering in and out of death initially uh, for, for sort of days on end. And he, he describes the darkness that he felt. Uh, and, and Gary said, you know, I, I, had been, I had been drunk many times in, in university. I blacked out before. I knew what it, what it was like to pass out. But this darkness in the hospital was something I'd never felt before. It was the darkness of death. And it was, it was a distinct experience, Gary says. So he's, he's, uh, he's wavering in and out of death and, uh, and feeling conflicted as a green beret 
because he, he's, he's saying, you know, look, I, I've been trained to be self-sufficient. If there's a job that needs to be done, I'm the guy to, to get it done. But this is one problem I can't solve. I can't, I can't will myself to keep living when, when death keeps coming to overtake me. And he says at that moment, uh, he felt shattered, shattered in spirit, shattered in soul. What am I going to do now that, uh, that I have no control over life and death? So there was a chaplain who was coming to visit Gary every day, even though Gary was, was unconscious. And the chaplain would come by to, to pray for Gary. And finally, uh, they connect where Gary is just loose enough to get out a few words. And, and the chaplain says, uh, you know, hello, son, I've been coming by your bed every day. I've been praying for you. Would you like to pray? And Gary is not a man of faith at that point in his life at all. I mean, he's far from it. And Gary says, pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know who to pray to. And the chaplain says, that's okay, son. God knows how to listen. And that was Gary's first prayer. Uh, 23 years old, lying in a hospital bed, uh, wavering between life and death. He says, God, if you are real, okay, <laughs> help me live. And, and that was really the start of Gary's faith journey. Again, it was kind of a process of uh, forward and backwards. It took a number of years. Uh, but he, he eventually uh, went on quite a journey there with his face. So. Sure. Um, and, you know, as you describe the condition that Gary was in at this time, even as he's healing physically and trying to heal mentally, you take us back to that time in the early, mid-70s, these moments when our Vietnam veterans were not welcome when they came back home. Um, they were scorned. Um, and tell us, uh, you know, how Gary was an example of that. Gary eventually heals in body, initially. Uh, he's still got a lot of shrapnel uh, inside of him. He, he's setting off metal detectors, but he's healed enough. He regains the use of his legs and he's walking. So he decides to return to university back in the States. Uh, initially, he wants to become a medical doctor. So he begins studies, um, but like so many of his generation of military personnel, it's he, he's scorned. Uh, you would think that a guy who went over there to save people would be celebrated when he when he returned, but that was not the case. And he describes any number of experiences where he was harassed on campus and, and shoved and pushed, literally spit upon one of the veterans who was, called names. There's one fairly uh, difficult scene there in the book where he is in his van uh, in, in, in the university parking lot and somehow uh, some guy figures out who he is and calls together this mob and they surround the van and they're shoving and shaking the van and calling him names and saying, come on out and fight. I mean, Gary's a Green Bray. If, if he wanted to come out and fight, he would get a couple good swings in, right? But yeah. he decides to keep his cool and generally he drives out of the mob and, and drives away. But he's shattered in spirit. And, and how am I going to deal with this? My own country doesn't want me back, or at least my university campus doesn't want me back. How do, how do I deal with this? How do I go forward? Yeah, and, you know, the tragic irony in the way that Gary was looked upon and uh, treated, uh, you know, literally, as he was often called a baby killer, and, you know, the kinds of things that you would hear for uh, the Vietnam vets were exposed to when they came Home. And the tragic irony is this guy was a baby saver if he was uh, anything, right? He was the guy delivering the babies. Yeah, he was the guy. Yeah. 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 Well, now, now you take us in Gary's story to just an unbelievable moment. But I think looking, having read your book and looking at, at um, Gary's personality, it probably it's not too surprising. But he decides to take up a living arrangement that's not all that usual for, for someone. Why don't you explain that for us? Well, he, he, he's so shattered in spirit, and he realizes that the only place where he really feels calm in spirit is when he's out in nature, when he's out hiking in, in the wilderness. So one day he's out hiking in the northern Appalachians, and he comes across this little cave, and, and he thinks to himself, you know, Maybe I'll spend a night in the cave. And he spends a night and he goes, you know what? I think I'm going to make this my home. And so Gary makes this pretty unusual decision to kind of tune in, drop out of the culture. And he takes his guitar and, and journal and, and 
the works of Thoreau and Walden Pond, and he hikes out, he finds uh, into, the, into the wilderness, finds this cave again, and he decides to live there. And, and he does. And I mean, he's, he's living through the, the winters and sort of enduring snow and ice, and he's bathing in streams and, and eating MREs and, you know, cooking over an open fire. And he is living literally in a cave. Yeah, just amazing. And if anyone spent time up in the Whites in New Hampshire during the winter, this is not a forgiving environment, right? <laughs> yeah, snowstorms and you name it, it's, it's frigid. Yeah, yeah um, but it turned out, didn't it, uh, Marcus, that this barren place uh, became a place of healing for Gary, did, did it not? Gary did big business inside the cave. I mean, he was he was uh, he had brought his Bible, he had brought his journal, he was doing inner soul work there, and trying to really reconcile with uh, where he had been with where he was now, and uh, the, the solitude of the cave uh, allowed him to um, to get out his, his emotions, and he would talk to the walls and and sort of you know yell at the at the ceiling and and uh, express his emotions and, and really work through what he'd been working through. So it, it eventually proved a very beneficial place. And then just being in nature, he said, uh, the daily hikes and uh, just being alone and, and experiencing this, this solitude experience was just tremendously healing for him. Yeah, then, um, you know, just this stunning, <laughs> this moment he encounters where you know, as he goes back from the cave infrequently to the college campus and into town, uh, he's left a note. Uh, it's <laughs> what a story. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing you see in a movie, right? Where he, uh, well, I won't give it up. Why don't you explain what occurs then? Yeah, he he's still enrolled uh, in university at the time, still taking some classes. Um, not sleeping overnight at the campus, but always hiking back into the wilderness to, uh, to spend the nights. And he keeps this post office box in a nearby town so he can get messages and his mail there. Uh, hikes back to the PO box, sees this note and says, please be at this payphone at such and such in time tomorrow. So the next day he goes to the payphone and it's the Pentagon calling. He can't believe it. Uh, but it's true. It's the Pentagon. Uh, are you Mr. Gary Bikerick? Uh, did you serve in such and such and such? Well, it's a pleasure to inform you that you're being awarded the Medal of Honor. Gary can't believe it. Takes the phone call, uh, goes back, hikes up to his cave, spends the night in his cave, and then comes down, gets on a plane, and flies to the White House. Receives the Medal of Honor from the president, and then uh, hikes back, flies back, and then hikes back and, and spends the rest of the time in his cave. It's, it's a caveman to the White House to the caveman story. And it, you know, <laughs> it happened just as Gary tells it. Yeah, just amazing. Uh, you know, now this is a, I guess, a, a miniature mystery for me, um, Marcus. And, I, and I, I wonder, tell me why. Uh, I expected, okay, now there's going to be a whole chapter on Gary's experience as this caveman at the White House, and there he is with Richard Nixon, and he's having the medal put around his shoulders and all. Why uh, didn't you explore that moment more in the book, or was it because, you know, Gary the caveman at the time could have cared less about being with the President of the United States? What, what's the reason for that? That's it exactly. Yeah, he was given an honorarium and uh, two handlers who were to take him out on the town. And Gary's like, uh, you know, I'm really, I'm more comfortable in my own clothes, in my old clothes. Uh, you know, if you guys want the honorarium, go and have a good dinner on me, that's fine. <laughs> Gary is, is, doesn't feel comfortable uh, in Washington. He doesn't feel comfortable with, with dignitaries, doesn't feel comfortable at all receiving this medal. But he, he decides to go through the process of receiving it uh, they do make him cut his hair. Uh, it's down past his shoulders by that point. And, and he says, well, okay, out of honor for the uniform, I want to wear my uniform, and they won't let me wear the uniform if I have long hair. So cuts his hair, receives the medal, and then he's done with it, shoves it in a duffel bag for seven years. Yeah, just amazing, really. Um, uh, okay, so Marcus, uh, now Gary 
he gets into life uh, post-Vietnam, struggles a, a whole lot. Tell us, um, if you can, just to encapsulate for us, you know, what, how's the story turn out for Gary? Uh, where does he end up? And, and uh, uh, you know, what's the period at the end of this sentence for, for Gary? Yeah, a lot of people ask me, what is the blaze of light? The title of the book, Blaze of Light. What is the blaze of light? And it really is open to interpretation. Some people interpret this story uh, that the blaze of light is actually the young woman that Gary meets, because there is a love element to this story. Uh, when he's when he's living in the cave and he's going down to town to get supplies, uh, he eventually meets this young woman, uh, and her name is Lolly. And Lolly has, has had some hard experiences of her own. She's a, a teenage mother, 18, 19 years old, got a little daughter who's two years old, but they strike up a friendship, Gary and Lolly, and then the strike, it, it blossoms into a romance. And Lolly basically says, uh, or Gary proposes one day, and Lolly says, well, I will marry you, but here's the deal, I'm not gonna live in the cave. So you gotta, you gotta make a choice, it's me or the cave. And Gary always sort of chuckles when he tells the story and says, you know, I, I made the bitter decision. So Lolly helps bring him out of the cave and, and, and then uh, really Lolly's got a, a whole book in her as well that we really couldn't get to uh, this time around, but it really is a process of, of this young husband and wife as they begin to uh, traverse life together. And Gary is still, um, still dealing with PTSD in, in fairly big ways. Uh, they actually buy a um, kind of this, this ramshackle property acreage that's got a little shack on it. And Gary wants to live in the shack with his family. And uh, so they've got her daughter who he adopts and then another boy comes along and eventually another girl. And they're living in this little shack in, in, in the woods and, and uh, heating uh, in, in the winters with a wood stove and there's ice on the walls and ice on the ceiling. And I mean, just really no great place to raise a family. But Lolly walked through, through that time with Gary and eventually helped him assimilate more and more back into culture. Yeah, and then he, he um, in many respects, he dedicated his life to faith and to a relationship with God and um, tried to uh, bring others into that same circle of light, as it were, right? Yeah, he, uh, that, that sort of that, I guess, a seed of faith that had been planted in his life in the hospital bed in Vietnam uh, eventually grew and, and flourished in his life. And it took him a number of years, but eventually uh, you could say he made a full uh, full conversion experience and began to follow God wholeheartedly. Um, uh, he was eventually made a chaplain of the Medal of, uh, Medal of Honor Society. And in that role, uh, he really flourished over the years. And this is probably later in life, but uh, he, he had this tremendous uh, ministry eventually of working in, uh, in, in prisons and in hospitals and sometimes schools and universities. And he would just go around and listen to people's stories and sort of everybody's got a story to tell of going through something difficult and Gary could relate. And well, let's talk about what you're going through. Let's help you through your rough time. So he, he eventually became just very, very successful in, uh, in helping people in life. Yeah, yeah. His, it seems to me, Marcus, his discovery was that by helping to heal others, he could heal himself, right? It's often the lesson that we find in stories like this. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so what it, you know, I, I know, Marcus, not every story has a moral to the story, but I just wonder, you, you personally as a writer, um, as someone who examines fascinating people like this, what's the moral to Gary Bykirk's story? Is there one, and what, what should we take away as generally as the, the, the meaning of his life in the book? Yeah, we dedicated the book to anyone who's ever uh, fought through a battle or sheltered in a cave. I mean, we all go through hard times and, and the tendency is, well, you really got to dig down and fight or you really want to sort of hunker down and, and close yourself off. And Gary's message uh, is much about much more about reaching out to people and and telling your story and, uh, and listening to people when they tell their stories. He tells of a fascinating time when he was able to return to Vietnam in the uh, early 1980s, 1982. And... Uh, his little delegation went from place to place and, and uh, toured various sites. And of course, Vietnam was under communist rule by then. Gary met uh, by a roadside one day. He, had, he met uh, an enemy officer, a former enemy officer. 
and they began to tell each other stories and the man spoke just enough English where they could communicate and and the man talked to Gary about uh, Gary's wounds and, and difficulties that he had been through and Gary told his story and then the man told his story that how he had lost family members and how he had been displaced and whatnot and and, and the man seemed so at peace and Gary asked him what his secret was and he said, look, you know, war is horrible. Nobody wins in war. I mean, there, there are winners and losers, but it, it, war always hurts. He said, the only way that I have been able to go forward in life is by forgiving, by forgiving people. And that day, Gary and this former NVA officer, they shook hands and, and they, uh, they forgave each other. Uh, what a beautiful picture that is, I think, of life. If, if we can truly listen to one another and learn each other's stories and walk forward together. Oh, well put, well put. Thanks, Marcus. And I, and thank you for Blaze of Light. What a wonderful story, like so many of the books that you've uh, written over time. And um, we so much appreciate you spending time with us today to, to tell about this wonderful story, Marcus. Very much so. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends, and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.